welcome to the Retro Horror Academy. My name is Daniel Richardson, and tonight we're going to be looking at the year 1944 in the year of horror. Uh, we got 10 films, horror films, from 1944 that we have ranked. Uh, but, you know what, before we get into that, let's talk about the Horror Hall of Fame. We got two, count them, two inductions. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Up first, we have Elizabeth Christensen. Uh, she's a Danish actor. That, or sorry, Danish actress uh, that you would know, we know on this show, for playing in Haxon, Witchcraft Through the Ages. And next, we have Alice Hollister. Uh, she's an American actress. She actually did lots of movies uh, during the uh, silent era up until like the 40s or so. Uh, but we would know her on this show for The Haunting Fear. Uh, both these women, you know, were really great in the role. And even though they didn't really do much uh, overall in the world of horror, uh, their impact, you know, for their little bit that did contribute, hey, you can still feel it now. So, uh, you know what? Uh, to both Elizabeth Christensen and Alice Hollister, go ahead and take your seat among the greats and welcome to the Horror Hall of Fame. So, without any further ado, let's get into our top 10 from 1944. Up first, at number 10. We have Weird Woman. So, Lon Chaney, he's uh, taking a trip down to the South Seas, and uh, he uh, comes across this woman. They fall in love, and uh, they get married. However, what he doesn't know is that superstition runs greatly through her uh, village that she's from, uh, so much so that they believe not only in magic, but also that, you know, this woman he marries possesses that same very magic herself. Uh, so this movie is a part of the Inner Sanctum uh, series. Uh, the Inner Sanctum series was uh, based on a uh, radio play, a, as a, a radio series uh, that dealt with like you know thriller, supernatural, horror, stuff like that. Um, all the films that they you know when they turn these uh, into movies, all the films were played by uh, Lon Chaney Jr. Although they're all standalones, like he never played. Uh, to my knowledge, at least you know. The first two he didn't, uh, but you know it seems like you know he played a different character in each of these films or whatever. Uh, we never, I never did see the, the first one. Uh, didn't make the cut as far as you know what movies came out, but one came out the year prior to this. Um, so this particular film, uh, Weird Woman, was actually based on the novel Conjure Wife, uh, which uh, the book itself would also get remade a couple more times, you know, in the uh, as time would go on. Uh, this movie stars Lon Chaney Jr. and uh, Evelyn Ankers. Uh, they also starred together in uh, The Wolfman and Ghost of Frankenstein. Uh, Evelyn Ankers, uh, she mentioned that she wasn't really big uh, playing a villain. Like She never felt comfortable or right playing a villain, and she really didn't think she did a good job at doing so. Uh, in fact, uh, the girl who plays uh, Lon Chaney's wife, uh, Anne Gwen, uh, her and Evelyn were actually best friends, and on the set, every time uh, they'd start rolling, and you know, it's time for Evelyn to become you know the villainous, you know the the bitch. Uh, they would just fall into hysterics, like she just could not pull it off. They said, uh, and she must have been right because apparently she was never cast as a villain after this. So, personally, on a personal note, I thought she did really good. I mean, she was very detestable in this film. I thought, uh, and I love Evelyn Anchors. Like I, you know, I, since doing this show. And seeing how many times she's been in horror films in this you know small period of time, like I've grown to really appreciate and uh, love her as an actress. Uh, you know, one of these kind of unsung heroes from this era that no one really talks about. Uh, and I, I, I thought she did really good, but that's just me. Uh, anyways, like I said, this is the second Inner Sanctum film. It will be followed by four more. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what did I think about this movie? Uh, I liked it. Again, I, w I was not familiar with the Inner Sanctum films. I don't know any of the other ones. This is my very first one getting into. Uh, I dug it. Uh, you know, again, the story itself was, I kind of feel like we've kind of covered this quite a bit. Especially when it comes like, you know, we've been kind of on a cycle of voodoo films. Uh, you know, I Walked with a Zombie and the like. So I kind of feel like we've kind of hit this territory before. But, again, Lon Chaney is really good. Or, you know, Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, really good. I thought Anne Gwen, this is my first time seeing her. I thought she did really good. And uh, Evelyn, you know. Fucking knocked it out of the park. So, you know what? I actually like this. Uh, this thing uh, has a 6.2 on uh, IMDb, and yeah, it seems about right, actually. So, uh, But yeah, number 10, Weird Woman. That brings us now to our, our number 9 film. I'm talking about Return of the Ape Man. Uh, basically, Mad Scientist decides he's going to put... Uh, the brain of a, you know, you'll put a brain into a, a caveman they just thawed out and gonna have this caveman do his bidding. 
Um, so this is a monogram picture, if you couldn't tell. Uh, stars uh, Bela Lugosi, John Carradine, which we're going to see a lot. Of, we've been seeing a lot of John Carradine anyway. It seems like uh, last year he started popping up quite a bit. But this year, woo we're going to see him quite a bit. New, new kid in town, you know. Uh, and it has George Zuko. Uh, however, there's a bit of an asterisk next to George Zuko's name in this film. Uh, he was cast to play the ape man. Uh, I guess I should say the, the caveman uh, with ape-like qualities or whatever. Uh, however, uh, and he's in the movie, but he's only in the movie for like a few seconds in one scene. Uh, however, you'll notice on the poster, he's got prominent billing. I believe he's third build uh, under uh, Lugosi and uh, Carradine. The reason for this was, was because when they started filming, he uh, came down very sick. And they got that one scene of him in the ice being thawed out. Uh, and that's George Zuko there. However, he became sick and they had to replace him. I think it's uh, Frank Moran, or Moran, or how you pronounce his name, took his spot. And you'll notice in the credits, they're both credited as, you know, the ape man. They weren't like trying to switch a rear or anything. However, I guess uh, it was in George Zuko's contract that, uh, guess what, I still get that top billing, so he got, you know, third billing, and I'm sure he still got paid for, you know, the entire whatever, but uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of the story behind uh, Zuko there. Uh, quick drink real quick. Thank you. I'm very professional here on the show. Uh, and finally... Uh, this was a sequel to The Ape Man, but it was a standalone sequel. It has nothing to do with the first one. In fact, the only kind of connection between the two is uh, Bela Lugosi played both, but he plays different characters, much like uh, Lon Chaney Jr. in the Inner Sanctum film. So, uh, yeah, even though this was kind of billed as the sequel, it's really not. It's its own film. Uh, so what do I think about this movie? Uh, you know what? I mean, I liked it for what it was. Again, we've seen these kind of films. It seems like, you know, voodoo and uh, Mad Scientist movies, and then when you combine the two, it, they're all the same. It really is the same thing. But again, the, the uh, you know, uh, Carradine, because uh, uh, Carradine and Lugosi both play uh, the scientists, you know, uh, dueling scientists, if you will, in this thing. And again, we've seen this kind of, you know, movie before, but I don't know. I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was pretty good. So, uh, yeah, Return of the Ape Man. Uh, IMDb has it at 4.8. That seems a little harsh, but I don't know. I'm a little bit more forgiving on some of these uh, old B uh Creature features, I guess. So, uh, so yeah, that was uh, Return of the Ape Man. So, we're going to move on now to number eight. I am, of course, talking about the Monster Maker. Uh, in this one, uh, another mad scientist, he's trying to get rid of anybody gets in his way by injecting him with this, like, virus. It's almost like, I guess, like, elephantitis, I guess. Like, it just makes you grow, like, your fingers get really big and your face becomes deformed and you just kind of get all elephant manish. Um, yeah. Monster Maker. So uh, this stars uh, John Car- or sorry J. Carroll Nash. Nash. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. Uh, he's been popping up lately too. He's become kind of a, a horror staple uh, veteran in these uh, horror films. Uh, this was actually the first uh, PRC horror film in like 17 months. Uh, apparently, the studio just bought out the uh, Chadwick Studios. And they were kind of getting everything merged together at this point. And I guess they just kind of neglected making horror films, which was kind of their bread and butter there for a while. Uh, so, yeah, first uh, horror film from PRC in uh, 17 months. Uh, so the characters of Dr. Uh, Markov, Mankoff, I think it's Markov, uh, and Steve, they make a lot of references to uh, Frankenstein uh, in this movie. And uh, it's just kind of ironic because the guy who played Steve was a man named uh, Glenn Strange, and he would actually go on this very year to play the monster in Frankenstein's, uh, uh, or in House of Frankenstein, sorry. So, um, you know, what I think about this movie, I like it. Again, it's, these are all, I mean, you can literally just kind of, the plot to all these are so fucking similar. But, I mean, they're easy watches, they're short films, Uh, you know, most of these movies are like an hour and some change. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I I liked it. And, uh, I'm becoming a fan of John Carroll uh, Nash as well. I think, you know, he's really good uh, as playing like these, like, you know, he's always, he's always playing like the, oh, like the Peter Lorre type. I don't know. He just, he always plays like the, you know, he has like that foreign menace kind of vibe to him. Uh, He's always playing the devious character. He can play it uh, sympathetic at times, but for the most part, you know, you do kind of root against him there at the end. Uh, But yeah, Monster Maker, I had fun with it. Sorry, I took a drink and did that one unannounced. So uh, yeah, number eight, the Monster Maker. So we're moving now to uh, number seven, and the film is Cry of the Werewolf. Uh, here it's uh, just Gypsy Woman. She has a secret, and she may kill to keep that secret. 
Uh, so this thing got mixed reviews when it came out. Uh, in fact, uh, Joe Dante, uh, director of movies like Gremlins and The Howling, uh, he put this on his like worst horror film list of all time. Uh, the main actress here, uh, Nina Foch, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, she would actually go on to, you know, she this is like her first time getting top billing, and she would actually go on to have a pretty good career. She would play in films like uh, An American in Paris, uh, she did the Ten Commandments, and she even uh, would receive a, a nomination for an Oscar for a Best Supporting Actress. So yeah, she got her uh, humble start here in the horror films, you know. But uh, she would go on to you know greener pastures, if you will. And the last little note I read, I thought it was kind of cute. Uh, I, I, I thought it was cute. I don't know, maybe it's animal cruelty. I don't know. You you tell me. Uh, but apparently, uh, to get the wolves to, uh, and I don't know if they were even rule wolves. I think they're probably German shepherds. But to get them to act like wolves and howl, uh, they put rubber bands around their muzzles. And I guess they were trying to, you know, open that up and it simulated them look like they were howling, which I thought looked good, actually. So, uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, I was kind of surprised that this movie kind of got the um, reception it got because, honestly, I enjoyed this movie. It had a very, um, I don't know, uh, oh, blanking on the guy's name. Uh, the producer of, uh, my God, yeah, the producer of, um, uh, I walk with a zombie and cat people. Oh, watching too many of these things. I'm losing track of who's doing what I'm, I'm cutting my notes. I'm sorry, guys. This is very uh, unprofessional of me. I rarely do this, but, uh, here we are. And when you know, I don't even have him in my notes right here. Well, anyways, that producer, uh, I can't believe I'm actually blanking on this guy's name. What a goddamn poser I am. Uh, and Tom, oh, Val Luton, goddamn it. I can't want to say uh, Lou Luton, or Lute whatever. Uh, no, Val Luton, sorry. Uh, this reminded me a lot of like a Val Luton um, movie, in a way. It just had the same kind of vibe to it. You know, are these people, are you know, are they really werewolves, are they not? You know, it had a very cat people-like vibe to it. Uh, but better, I thought. So, I don't know. The fact that oh, Joe Dante's like, this is one of the worst movies. I don't know. I, I liked it. Um, it does have a 5.3 on IMDb, which, you know, ain't terrible, but ain't great either. But, um, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. I was a fan of it. Uh, Take it on dark. Sorry, I'm coming down. I'm getting over a cold right now. I'm, my throat gets a little drier than it normally does. So, uh, so anyways, that was uh, number seven, Cry of the Werewolf. Again, I'm recommending it. Uh, up next, at number six, we have The Invisible Man's Revenge. Uh, here, mad scientist, of course. But he's actually kind of a good guy. Like, he's not really a mad scientist, I guess. I guess, you know, in this case, we'll call him more, like, eccentric. Because he's, he's a good guy. He, he's not doing it for evil reasons. But a uh, scientist, he uh, helps this guy. He's a, a escaped convict, a fugitive uh, from the law, uh, he helps him, because again, he's doing this experiment to turn people invisible, and he turns him invisible, however, by doing so, he kind of, you know, unwittingly kind of creates a monster, so, um, this is, uh, stars, uh, John Carradine as the scientist who's, you know, performing his stuff on there, um, the character, uh, he has the last name, he shares the last name with the other invisible men, Griffin, However, they never make any connection between this Griffin and the previous two. They actually don't make any, uh, they don't mention the previous movies at all. Uh, so it doesn't seem like he's actually, it's a, it's its own standalone movie. He just happens to be last name Griffin as well, uh, which I thought was kind of, kind of weird or whatever. <coughs> Apparently though, the studio wanted Claude Rains to return, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. Uh, John Hall, who would go on and play, you know, he was the invisible man in this movie, uh, he was actually, he played a, a different Invisible Man. He played the Griffin, I think. And again, I didn't see what I'm about to say, but I believe he, uh, the character was the same character from um, The uh, Invisible Man Returns. Um, or The Return of the Invisible Man, sorry. Um, anyways, he played that in the film Invisible Agent that came out two years earlier. Uh, never seen Invisible Agent or uh, The Invisible Woman. Apparently, IMDb, considers them part of the series. Like, it's canon with the other film. But I guess, you know, if he's playing Griffin in that previous one, it must be. But, yeah, i never seen him, so I can't really comment on Invisible Agent or Invisible Woman. But, anyways, that's kind of weird that, you know, they bring John Hall, or John Hall back, 
that was a different character. Um, this thing came out, it had mostly bad reviews. Uh, seemed like the common sentiment here was, like, the uh, special effects look great, but we've already seen it, and now we're kind of looking at the story, and the story just doesn't seem to be there. It does kind of remind me of, like, I guess, like, Jurassic Park. You know, it's like, that first Jurassic Park movie, you're like, oh, man, like, this is incredible. Like, I mean, I don't know if you guys remember. I'm talking about the crowd that's my age, who, you know, grew up in a time when it's like, the only time you've seen dinosaurs was, like, claymation. Really bad, you know, stop motion animated dinosaurs. And so when we saw Jurassic Park for the first time in 1993, it was mind blowing. It really was. Like, it was just, it was truly, you're seeing something you have never seen before. And the thing is, you know, the effects, you know, depending on you look at it, you know, they do get better. Uh, they still look incredible. But it's like, yeah, we're so desensitized to it. It's like, yeah, yeah, we've seen these great dinosaurs, but it gives a good story. Which, you know, the Jurassic Park franchise has not been doing for the past two or three films. So, you know, whatever. But, uh, I don't know, I just kind of read that and it's kind of reminded me of that. Because it's like, yeah, looks great, bud. But, you know, you got to have a good story to go with it, I guess. Uh, so, anyways, I have noticed, though, that as time has gone on, it seems like reviews have gotten a little bit better for this one. They've been, you know, they kind of lightened up a little bit over uh, on this film. Uh, John Carradine, who I guess uh, n- was notorious for not liking horror films. Like, even though he was, like, in every horror film uh, from beginning of time, he uh, wasn't a fan of them, but he said he actually liked this movie, so take that for what it is. Uh, this would be the last Invisible Man film in the series. However, uh, the Invisible Man would return in the uh, film Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man, uh, which, I don't know, I guess they're not considered canon, but I always did consider those films canon, like, even though they're, you know, kind of goofy and, you know, more of like a spoof or parody I don't know. It seemed like they were the same characters. Like they weren't, you know, whatever. But I, you know, again, I, I've never, I've only seen a handful of them, uh, and they've been a long time ago. So I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, definitely, be re, you know, revisiting them as we go through the series. So I'm sure I'll, I'll catch up on a few of them. But uh, yeah, I, I always kind of consider them canon. So what I think about this film, I liked it. I thought this was really good. I don't think it was as good as the previous two Invisible Man movies I saw, but I like the villain in this one. Like the previous two were. Good guys who were driven insane by turning invisible. Whereas this guy was already a dick. Like, this guy was already a villain who now gets invisible. And they don't really play on that. Like, it never is, like, mentioned if whether or not the serum that he's getting is turning him more insane or not. Which I thought was kind of a missed opportunity. Because, like, yeah, those guys, like, previously were, like, good guys who were turned evil. This guy was already evil. So, like, they really could have, they kind of missed the opportunity to kind of, you know, play into that. But either way, I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought, you know, again, uh, my girl Evelyn Anchors in this, in this movie. Uh, you know, I love seeing her. Uh, you know, John Carradine, awesome as always. So, and I thought John Hall did a good job as, you know, the Invisible Man here. So, yeah, uh, this is currently at a 5.6 on a IMDb, uh, at 40% on Rotten Tomatoes. And the film grossed like 0.8 million, so it didn't do bad at the box office uh, for its time. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I liked it. I I, I recommend it. Uh, the Invisible Man's Revenge. In fact, I I dare say this may be my movie of this year, actually, of 1944. Because uh, this movie this, this year was kind of hit or miss on, on a lot of films. A lot of I don't want to say it's necessarily hit or miss. There wasn't like anything atrocious, and there wasn't anything great. A lot of the middle middle of the road kind of you know view, you know vibes for me. A lot of like easy watches. I don't know if I'd return to a lot of these or not, but uh, oh, this was all right. I, I enjoyed it. So yeah, Invisible Man's uh, Revenge. So that brings us now to we're halfway through. We're up to number five, and our number five uh, horror film of 1944 is The Climax, where a uh, psychotic doctor. It's just calling that science. That's what he is. Uh, you know, he becomes obsessed when he hears like this young girl singing because it reminds him of the singing voice of his late wife. Uh, so, uh, this movie, uh, was originally meant to be a sequel to the fan of the opera, uh, which I didn't know that when I first watched this thing. Uh, anyways, it was, uh, of course, now that I read that, I was like, oh, it makes, you know, a lot of sense, actually. You can see a lot of similarities or whatever. Um, uh, anyway, but this was actually nominated for an Oscar for, uh, bet, uh, sorry, best art direction. Uh, always good when a horror film, you know, reaches that upper echelon of high class in society and gets itself, uh, in the Oscar race. I'm going to take a quick drink. Uh, 
Oh, sorry about that. Uh, however, uh, even with his critical claim, this movie was a box office disappointment. Um, this was actually shot on the set of Phantom of the Opera. Stars a uh, horror icon Boris Karloff. And this is actually Boris Karloff's first uh, movie to be shot in color. So what I think about this, you know, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Um, again, knowing now that, you know, originally it's supposed to be a sequel to Phantom of the Opera, which I thought was kind of a cool idea. Um... Which I'm not sure what you would do with it exactly. You know, they they, they killed the fam at the end. That's probably why they didn't follow through with it. Uh, no, I thought it was really good. Again, it does fall. It falls under that same mad scientist type film. Uh, but I do remember uh, the first time I saw this. Actually, um, I had a box set. It's like a Boris Karloff uh, collection. It had like five films in it. And uh, I remember really digging it, but that box set was very hit or miss as well. Like, I have always said Boris Karloff is, like, one of my favorite actors of all time. I think he's just great in everything he does. Uh, I've seen him play many different types of characters. Even though he kind of plays the same uh, mad scientist type, his acting's always, you know, there's always subtle differences throughout. And so, you know, again, I thought he did great in this, and I thought the movie was good. Again, it's not, you know, setting the world on fire, and, you know, it's... You know, it is what it is. But, uh, no, I overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, this currently has a 5.4 on IMDb, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm saying check it out. So, number four, we have The Uninvited. Uh, brother and sister find out that the reason that their awesome gothic uh, mansion over there on the uh, sea uh, coastline uh, it was cheap was because it has a very dark past to it. Uh, so this is based on a novel, uh, and originally they wanted uh, Alfred Hitchcock to direct it. However, that fell through for whatever reason, but uh, I did read later on that I guess Hitchcock did actually kind of give him some pointers and kind of told him, like, you know, here's what I would do in you know, this situation. So he kind of, you know, he kind of you know, gave him a little bit of, you know, some help along the way with this thing. Uh, this would wind up being one of the highest, or sorry, one of the highest grossing films of that year. Um, and, of course, this kind of came on the heels of, uh, but we were kind of having, we went through a cycle of like a supernatural haunted house movies, I guess you can say, uh, which include movies like, you know, Dead of Night and whatnot. Uh, so, and it kind of, I don't know, it kind of stopped after this for whatever reason, which is kind of weird that this one was a, you know, it knocked it out of the park uh, with, you know, the fans or whatever. But for whatever reason, you know, it didn't really, it didn't like continue the cycle. I guess people were getting kind of burnt out or decided to end it on a high note. I don't know. Uh, anyways, it uh, turns out that the uh, crew and some of the cast was not really thrilled with uh, Gail Russell being um, cast. Uh, apparently, I guess she would break down and cry a lot on set and just difficult to work with, and I don't know. They said she was really young, though, and I'm not saying that gives it any kind of, you know, pass or whatever, but they did say, like, yeah, she just, I don't know, she was just really hard to work with, and the director had to get rough with her, and just, you know, all the horror stories you hear about, stuff like that. So, uh, it was, you know, all, all of this one. In fact, the only one that really kind of, I guess, was nice to her on set was uh, her co-star, uh, Ray um, Millen. Is that how you pronounce his last name? Uh, apparently, like, he kind of took, you know, he, he, he's patient with her, took her aside, tried to, you know, help run her lines. Because I guess she'd only get, like, one or two lines out, and then she'd break down. Or one or two lines out, and then just stop and go to her trailer. Uh, and her mom was always on set with her and also caused issues, so... Anyways, um, so uh, apparently there's a Catholic group called the Legion of Decency. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, anyways, I guess they were upset at this movie for what they perceived to be this uh, lesbian subtext with the character of uh, Nurse Holloway. And it's funny because, I don't know, I rarely see these. The only time, I mean, I've, there have been a couple times where I've read this and I'm like, yeah, I kind of thought that when I was watching it, but I didn't put much thought beyond that. But a lot of times, like, I don't see it. Like, with uh, Dracula's daughter, I guess I was just oblivious when I watched that, because I'm just like, I don't know. And then it turns out, it's like, no, that was a very implied, you know, whatever. And so here, I didn't read if it was implied or not, or if it was meant to be, you know, have this, like, lesbian subtext, but apparently they read into it. And not only were they upset about that, but then they were claiming that, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact verbiage here, but they were saying things like, and the unsavory crowd that this, you know, attracts to late night, you know, things. It's very disturbing, you know, to these late night screenings that clearly they're only watching this movie for this lesbian subtext. So, I don't know. I feel like every time you get the church kind of coming after your movie, you're doing a good job. You know, you're on the right path. Uh, 
this thing actually was, uh, you know, widely acclaimed and re uh, received by audiences and critics alike. Uh, they really kind of gravitated to the fact that this wasn't campy. There was no comedy in this hardly. Uh, you know, it was played very real, very seriousness. And on top of that, they were also very, you know, the fact that this is a ghost movie. Like, this is one of the few times where it's like, you know, usually you get that Scooby-Doo ending where it's like, you know, it's a neighbor that's trying to drive the people out of the, you know, the house so he can, you know, look for that gold inside the house or whatever. Or you get a lot of the, um, just a wacky misunderstanding. Oh, it's a cat the whole time. Or, you know, people think it's haunted and they're just bumping into, our, bumping into each other at night and they're letting their imagination get away from them. But it's never actually haunted. This is the first, you know, one of the first times where it's like, nope, it's haunted. Like, there, there's, there's ghosts in this house. And, uh, yeah, proved that people were okay with that. You know, they were ready for it to be real. We don't have to sugarcoat no more. Um, and then on top of that, people also praised, you know, I, I talked about how much, you know, crap that everyone was kind of putting up with when it came to, um, oh, Gail Russell. But it turns out people really loved her performance in this. So, I mean, you know, again, you know, say what you want, but she, you know, she delivered the goods and critics loved her for it, you know, and she actually had a pretty good career after this. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. Um, you know, it's still considered a classic, although... I've noticed when I started looking at the like, kind of the uh, critics of today, looking back on this, it's not as untouchable as I thought it was. Uh, kind of the same thing with the cat people, where I thought like you know it was just like oh it's a classic stand the test of time, and everyone just assumes it's brilliant. And it turns out no, like this movie, your people are kind of looking at the flaws of this film or whatever even now. So it's not like we're looking back with you know rose tinted glasses like this is this is great. No, no, you know there, there are some people who aren't as happy with it you know as they were back then. Uh, we mentioned earlier with the climax, you know, it was nominated for an Oscar. Well, so was this movie. Uh, this was nominated for best, uh, cinematography for a black and white film. So, uh, again, always good to see when a horror film, you know, can kind of rise above, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to sell out, uh, you know, I, if, it, if it's just, if we're just stuck in the grind house forever and we're going to be looked down upon by everybody else, great. But you know what, when people do kind of break out and you can convince other people like, Hey, there's more to these horror films than just, you know, the horrorness of it, you know, it's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. So, and finally, uh, Martin Scorsese had this on his list of, uh, best horror films, uh, ever made, uh, or sorry, I think he actually said scariest. I just bet like scariest horror films. So there's that, take that what you will. What I think about this movie, honestly, I wasn't big on it. I found this to be boring. Um, again, this was one of those movies that had a lot of hype for me going in and that may have been one reason. I also, but I didn't know too, like, you know, a lot of people was like, you know, it's what you don't see is what, you know, kind of spooky. Even though we do see the specter at the end, you know, but for the most part, it's like, you know, it's all kind of, is it ambiguous? Is it in their head? Is it, you know, is it really haunted or whatever? And I don't know, you know, don't get me wrong, it, that works sometimes for me. I can watch movies that, you know, are more about suspense or the build or, you know, that kind of rely on the whole, you don't show them, you just tell them. And that does work sometimes. I'm not just saying like I have to, you know, I'm some kind of, you know, idiot who has to be like, you got to show me the show me the explosion, show me all the good stuff. I'm not like that, but sometimes I am. And I'm sorry as I'm watching this, I'm just like, I just don't care. Just fucking show me a goddamn ghost. Let's just do it. Like, let's sit doing this. I don't know. I feel like everyone's, you know, they're trying to do that Val Luton thing right now at this point where it's like, yeah, we'll make everything in the shadows. And it's like, I don't give a fuck. Just show me the goddamn ghost. And I don't know. I, I wasn't huge on this film. However, it got a 7.2 on IMDb currently, and uh, everyone here at the Academy seemed to love it, so you know what? It is what it is. So, uh, The Uninvited. Not for me, but hey, it may be for you. So, I'll take a quick drink, and we're going to get to number three. At number three, and winner of the Bronze Skull Award, I am talking about The Mummy's Curse. Uh, Karis. The uh, mummy, he is uh, back, and he's just roaming the swamps looking for his true love. Uh, this was the final uh, mummy movie in the series, but like I said with The Invisible Man's Revenge, uh, he would return in the Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy. And again, I consider that canon. Uh, which I don't know, i never seen that one though, so I don't know if it's Cares or if it's uh, Emotep, or if it's a third mummy that we don't know about, I don't know. But uh, anyways, but yeah, this would be the final uh, in this uh, series. Uh, this picks up right after where the last one left off, uh, but they were used a lot of footage from uh, the mummy in the mummy's hand. Uh, 
Uh, this thing, when it came out, got bad reviews. And that the big two reasons was, A, people were complaining about, you know, clearly the uh, the reusing of uh, old footage. But they were also kind of confused with the setting because, you know, the last movie took place, like, in New England. It's like, like Massachusetts or whatever. And they don't mention it. They, I don't, I mean, unless I missed it, I don't think they moved or anything. Yet we're in like a swampland area, and then you know we got a guy named Cajun Joe. It's like this is clearly Louisiana. In fact, uh, on IMDb, it even says in their description, like you know we get shipped to Louisiana. It's just like I don't remember that. I mean, I met. I, it's very possible. I've seen this movie a couple times. Maybe I missed it each time where they, they had a quick little passage like, oh yeah, we're Louisiana now. But either way, uh, yeah, uh, I guess people were kind of just as confused as I was. And that was one reason I didn't, didn't care for this thing. Uh, this is also on Joe Dante's uh, list of worst horror films of all time. Uh, so apparently, uh, according to Legend, which I gave no really Legend, I guess a lot of people kind of vouch for this. Uh, Lon Chaney Jr., you know, he had a bit of a problem with drinking around this time. And it got so bad that uh, they really used his stand-in a lot more. Uh, in fact, at one point, I believe it's this movie, he's carrying somebody. And uh, they were complaining, like, you know, he's going to fall. Like, and it's going to hurt me. And so, you know, it may have been a Virginia Christine, I think, the uh, the lead girl in this thing. But anyways, uh, complaining. And so they used his standing quite a bit in this film. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's that right there. Um, so this is the only Mummy movie uh, in the Karis series, I should say. Not the original, but in the Karis series that doesn't have a George Zuko in it. Uh, but I didn't look it up. I didn't do the timeline. But I'm willing to bet it's because uh, I mentioned earlier with uh, oh what was that movie I mentioned him in Return of the Ape Man that's it uh, that you know he was out sick in that movie uh, he got ill and I'm one of the best probably what it was here so uh, probably wasn't able to make it back because of that right there um, and then this is kind of an interesting little whatever here we look at the timeline of this movie uh, so the Mummy's Hand was set in 1940 that's when it came out it was set in 1940. The Mummy's Tomb, however, it takes place 30 years later, which would set it in 1970. Now, The Mummy's Ghost, this takes years, uh, or takes place two years later, so that's 1972, but this film takes place 25 years after that. And so that places this up in 1997. Now, why it's interesting is because they all look like they're from the 40s. Like they made no effort to futurize this at all. Like these, all these films are like they're just set like when they're shot. So ah, this all that's kind of funny. This thing's supposed to take place in 1997. It's like, you know, all the cars are still old. The, you know, no one has phones like cell phones or uh, VHS players or no TV yet. It, it just, oh, it's just funny to me. Sorry. Uh, so anyways, uh, so what I think of this movie, um, you know, I, the whole Mummy series, with the exception of maybe the first one. I do just kind of feel like they run together for me. Uh, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. These are actually easy, fun watches. Uh, they're good. But honestly, if you know, before I went back and rewatched all these, if you would have been like, hey, what's this movie about? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'd be like, I don't know. I saw it. I remember, you know, I bought the box set. I watched all four of the, or all five of the movies. Uh, with the exception of the first one, they all run together for me. Uh, and this one was no exception. Uh, I will say what I did like about this one was it does have kind of a bittersweet ending because the young girl who is supposed to be a reincarnated version of uh, his, you know, the princess, uh, you assume, like, that's it. Like, he's, uh, or, you know, she's going to, you know, wake up and, the, you know, the mummy will get his and he'll fall into the swamp and that'll be the end of that. But she will get away. He's like, no, no, she doesn't. Like, literally, she decomposes at the end and all that. You know, very, very sad, very, very bittersweet ending there. So, anyways, yeah. The Mummy's Curse, uh, you know, I liked it. I thought, you know, I thought, it was, you know, for what it was, it was good. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, they all do kind of run together for me. And it's the fact that I don't know. Not that any of the movies from this era is scary per se, but this one never felt like I don't know. The Mummy movies almost never felt like horror films to me. Or if they do, at the very best, it, it falls more into like that. I don't know. You see, it, it, they seem like carbon copies of Wolfman or. Frankenstein, uh, it's just a mummy instead. So I don't know. Like I said, it is what it is. I enjoy it, but yeah, I can see why you know horror is starting to die around this era right here. So uh, we're getting to into that into the cycle, and it's coming soon. But anyways, 
Bronze Skull Award, The Mummy's Curse. So now we move on to our number two horror film of 1944. And the winner of the Silver Skull Award, I am talking about The Mummy's Ghost. Uh, this is actually part three in the Karis movies. That's right. We had two Mummy movies coming out in the same year. They were just churning this shit out. Um, so the actress Aquanetta, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, you know her. She was uh, Paula the Ep Woman. We covered her already on this channel. Uh previously, uh, wild captive women or woman. Um, anyway, she was supposed to be the main girl in this movie. Uh, however, on the set, there's an accident. She slipped and fell or she fainted and fell and hit her head on a rock. That was supposed to be a prop, but they just painted real rocks with paint. Anyway, she, her recollection is she slipped, hit her head. And then when she woke up in the hospital, uh, you know, she was bandaged up and then they informed her. Yeah, we already recast you. It's like, damn, that's cold. So, yeah, um, I hope those Paula movies pay off for you because you ain't getting that mummy check. Sorry, I took a drink. Um, so, here, you know, again, we always, um, we talk about, you know, Lon Chaney Jr.'s reputation for being drunk. And we kind of alluded that a bit on um, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Uh, that, you know, Lon Chaney wasn't in his costume or his makeup the entire shoot. And, you know, they some debate of, you know, how much was actually him and how much was his stunt double or whatever. Uh, and so, but the director, a guy named uh, Reginald uh, Leborg, Leborg uh, he claimed many years later that, no, like, Lon Chaney did every single scene of this movie. Like, it, you know, there was no stunt double in this one. So, again, now this was, you know, shot before... Uh, curse, which was you know when it was claimed that the stand-in was in it for quite a bit. So again, maybe his drinking didn't get that bad, and he was kind of more in control during this movie. Uh, however, the director would get mad at Lon Chaney uh, during the scene here, uh, the scene where he chokes out the professor, kills him, you know, strangles the professor. I guess like he really did go to town on that actor, like to the point where he left bruises on the guy's neck, and so the you know the director was kind of pissed at him there for a minute and kind of had to take him aside and you know chew him out a little bit or whatever. Um, when this movie came out, it got, you know, middle of the road reviews, uh, which again, I'm not really surprised by that. Um, Chaney did actually cut him, like, you know, aside, you know, aside from Aquanetta getting injured on the, on the set, uh, Chaney got a uh, cut on the set because, uh, during the scene where he's in the museum and he goes on a rampage, just destroying everything, uh, the prop master forgot to put the breakaway glass in the, uh, museum there. And so that's real glass that he's breaking through and he ended up cutting his chin and, uh, yeah, really bleeding out or whatever. So there you go. <coughs> this movie also stars uh, horror icons John Carradine and George Zuko. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, Chaney claims that uh, the mummy makeup was his least favorite to put on. This is a guy who has played all of them. He, you know, he played Frankenstein's monster. He played the Wolfman. But apparently he hated the mummy makeup. All right, so what I think about this movie, you know, it, much like my review for The Mummy's Curse, you know, again, I enjoyed this movie. I liked it. You know, I, I do like this one a little bit more. Than the previous one, uh, you know the whole idea. You know, I, the only thing that kind of irked me, I guess, at the end was just kind of how, how stupid the uh, high priest guy is, where he finds the girl. And he's like, "I want her for myself." And it's like, "Are you an idiot, dude? Like this mummy's gonna kill you." And of course he does. I remember that's like the one thing that stood out for me for whatever reason. I'm just like, "What the fuck?" But I don't know. Again, I enjoy these movies. They're a fun watch. This is one of those like you know, again with a lot of the movies from this era, the you know the good ones, anyways. I feel like you can just throw this on at any time and you can just easily watch because they're not that long. You know, they're like a little over an hour a piece. So it's like, I don't know, it's like watching a TV special or something like that. Uh, you know, they're easy to digest, they're easy to put down. Uh, again, you know, with the settings, you know, this one they clearly established during Massachusetts with the previous one, which would take place after this one. Sorry, part five. We're just in Louisiana out of nowhere. But, you know, my God, we did... If we can do a Jason movie where in one sequel he gets mutated to a little boy in a sewer and then part nine he's beefed up again. It's like, ah, are we really going to pick apart an old 1944 horror film? I think not. Uh, so, yeah, you know what? I enjoy it. I do think with the Mummy series, they kind of, for the most part, they get worse as they go on. I think the, the best one was the first one with Karloff. Uh, and then they just kind of, you know, spiral down after that. But... Hey, that's horror in general, usually anyway. So, uh, this currently has a 5.6 on IMDb and a 33% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, uh, but anyways, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, The Mummy's Ghost.
All right, take one last drink, and then we're going to get into it. We are now looking at the number one horror film in 1944, and the winner of the Golden Skull Award. I am talking about The House of Frankenstein. This thing stars them all. It has Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine, and uh, J. Carroll Nash. Um, now, while it didn't do great, I thought this was kind of an interesting little side note, while it didn't do great at the box office, it did outgrow The Invisible Man Revenge, so uh, there you go. Uh, so, I mentioned in the last episode, uh, we did 1943, that they were going to do a movie called Chamber of Horrors that was going to include The Invisible Man, um, uh, sorry, The Mad Ghoul, and... Um, Oh, the mummy. However, uh, turned out, I guess for budgetary reasons, they cut all that stuff out and trimmed down to what we got here. Uh, Kurt Sidomack, uh, he wrote the first draft. Uh, however, uh, Edward T. Lowe would come in and rewrite it drastically to trim it down to the bare essentials. Uh, Edward T. Lowe, actually, he uh, has a bit of a background in horror. He wrote the scripts for The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Vampire's Bat, so... Uh, yeah, as uh, prestigious as Kurt Sidomack is in the realm of horror, uh, Edward T. Lowell was uh, no slouch himself. So, um, Anne Gwen, which we mentioned her previously uh, when we were talking about Weird Woman, uh, she stated, you know, uh, when she was talking to Karloff, she got this, the sense that he wasn't really that thrilled to be in the mad scientist role. Which, I don't know, it's kind of weird. It's like, well, what do you want to do? Because he already publicly said he does not want to do the monster anymore. You know, he was done playing the monster. It's like, well, I don't know. Like, well, did you want me to Wolfman? I can't imagine you wouldn't do anything that involved makeup at this point. So it's kind of like, well, what did you want? But I don't know. He, uh, I guess he's just done playing that. In fact, I remember uh, reading later on where, like, you know, he was doing a movie for a guy. And he was, like, thanking that guy for, like, you know, for quote, unquote, like, saving his life. You got him out of these dreadful, you know, kids horror films that he was kind of stuck in. And it's like... You know, damn, buddy, why don't you tell us how you really feel? Uh, anyways, though, uh, so we got Glenn Strange here playing the monster in this film. Uh, you know, he's you know no slash to horror at this point either. Uh, he had a small role in the Mummy's Tomb, but uh, he was uh, he did you know the the Mad Monster, and then of course this year we mentioned it earlier on the list. He did the Monster Maker, so you know Glenn Strange stepping into the role of the monster. Um, this had the biggest budget of any Frankenstein movie to date. However. The asterisk there is, is even though this was given the most money to be made, uh, both Frankenstein and Briar Frankenstein went over budget. So technically they actually were more expensive, you know, than this one. But in those initial pre-production stages, this was given the biggest budget there. So uh, this would reuse sets from the Tower of London. Uh, apparently to kind of keep spirits and morale up on the set, John Carradine would recite Shakespeare for everybody. And it was said that Lon Chaney would actually bring in quote-unquote, lavish lunches for his co-stars. Uh, Glenn Strange, however, he didn't have a great time. He uh, hated the makeup. Uh, and apparently when he was in full makeup, Universal wouldn't let him eat in the lunch hall. That's kind of fucked up. But uh, yeah, they wouldn't do it. So there's that. Uh, we had a bit of an accident on set here. Uh, it, was, it wasn't as bad as, you know, some of the previous ones in previous movies. But it could have been bad. Uh, so in the scene where Frankenstein's monster throws the hunchback out the window, Glenn Strange actually throwing J. Carol Nash, or Car- Carol Na- Nash, I think it's Nash, uh, out the window, uh, he misses the mattress out there and went splat on the concrete. However, playing the hunchback, he had padding on his back. And so when he hits the ground, you know, luckily that, you know, padding broke his fall because it could have been a lot worse. And there now, it definitely saved him right there. Uh, this movie was very popular among audiences. Uh, I think critically, not so much, but audiences, it seems like, uh, you know, this was kind of in theaters for quite a while, like, you know, weeks, you know, even. Uh, which is always a good sign. You always want your movie, you know, even if it's not going to make a lot of money, you want to have legs, you know, you want to continue you know, to grow or whatever. So uh, this thing was double billed with The uh, Mummy's Curse. Uh, it would be followed by the film House of Dracula, which was originally titled, I guess, The Wolfman vs. Dracula. But, uh, you know, I guess since House of Frankenstein did pretty good, they're like, you know what? House of Dracula. Why not? Uh, however, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, the reviews were definitely more bad than good on this one. Uh, apparently, Boris Karloff, I guess, and Gwen was right because uh, he was not a fan of this movie at all. Uh, 
Bill Lugosi apparently is supposed to play Dracula in this film because you know you got all these heavyweights in this thing. Uh, however, uh, I guess due to some scheduling conflicts, he wasn't able to make it. Um, so yeah, which that kind of sucks because it's who you really want to be in this thing. But you know, it is what it is. Uh, Peter Coe, apparently, he was upset that John Carradine kept upstaging him and intentionally trying to steal the scenes from him. And uh, this is according to Peter Coe. I guess he allegedly threatened John Carradine uh, on the set to get him to kind of, you know, act you know act right or whatever. Uh, I haven't read anything to the contrary of this, so I don't know how true this is. Uh, but, you know, that's the story I read right there, so I guess I'd, you know, pass it on to you guys. Uh, the scene where Dracula transforms into a bat, you know, there's, it's done with animation. The guy who animated that would actually go on to uh, create Woody Woodpecker. How's that for some weird connection there between one of America's beloved animated characters and uh, horror? So there you go. Uh, it was said that Boris Karloff uh, coached Glenn Strange on the set of how to portray the monster since, you know, he clearly had a path. He did three films as, you know, the monster himself. So, uh, so there's that. Apparently, Universal uh, would constantly hire outside actresses to come in and uh, scream. And they'd record the screams and then overdub it for their lead actresses in the movie. But apparently, uh, Elena Vendargo? I don't know if I'm saying that right. The main girl, the, the, the love interest for uh, oh, Lon Chaney Jr. here. Uh, she didn't need that. Apparently, she was a scream queen through and through. So all her screams that she did in this movie, they were legitimately hers. Uh, this is the first Frankenstein movie uh, to not involve an actual member of the Frankenstein family. So that's kind of interesting. And even though we have all three monsters in this movie, they do not, in fact, mix it up at all. So what do I think about this movie? Honestly, I will say, yeah, I was very disappointed by this film. Uh, you know, I thought the acting was okay. I don't know. I thought uh, he wasn't in it very much, but for what little bit John Carradine played Dracula, I thought he was kind of a weird fit. I didn't care for him. Uh, I didn't mind when Lon Chaney Jr. played him, you know, before, but for whatever reason, I just didn't care for his portrayal on this one, but that's besides the point. Um, my biggest thing was, at the time I watched it, you know, I was, I, I didn't watch them all in order. Uh, I watched them kind of out of order, actually, but as I'm going through all these old Universal horror films, you know, you'd see trailers for other horror, uh, Universal horror films of this era, and I remember seeing this one, and this was like, they were hyping it up, man. They're just like, for the first time ever, you're going to have Dracula. You're going to have, uh, you know, Lon Chain, or no, sorry, uh, the Wolfman, uh, you know, Frankenstein's monster. You're going to have a mad scientist on a hunchback, all in the same film. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was pumped. I was like, we're going to see a fucking monster battle royal here. And it never happens. In fact, Dracula is only in it for a couple scenes. And then he's done. I'm like, what? Already? We're, we're already done with that? And, uh, yeah, we move right along, go to the next, you know, whatever. And then, like I said, we get both Wolfman and Frankenstein's monster, which they had history. And I enjoyed, you know, what little bit we got in uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. We did get a little bit of a monster match there. So I was like, all right, well, here we go. We're going to see it here. And we don't. And you're just like, wow. It just seemed like you had, like, two different storylines there at the end running parallel. And that's it. And I was just like, I don't know. And they each conclude, and that's the end of that. And I just kept thinking, like, I don't know. <coughs> I was just disappointed by this movie. Again, the acting, with the exception of maybe John... And I'm not saying John Carradine did a bad job. It's just, I didn't... I just didn't think his performance as Dracula was that great. That's all I'm saying. But everyone else hit their mark great, but it was just, I don't know. This movie itself was just, I don't know. It was what it was. Uh, so I honestly wasn't that big on it. It got 6.2 on IMDb currently. And it's at 55% on Rotten Tomatoes. But uh, yeah, for me personally, just wasn't huge on it. But that's just me. Uh, but guys, that has been the year 1944 in horror. Quick recap. We had two inductions or inductees into the uh, Horror Hall of Fame with Elizabeth Christensen and uh, Alice Hollister. And then our top 10 was Weird Woman, Return of the Ape Man, The Monster Maker, Cry of the Werewolf, The Invisible Man's Revenge, The Climax, The Uninvited, The Mummy's Curse, The Mummy's Ghost, and House of Frankenstein. So guys, there you have it. Uh, yep, that was 1944 in horror. Tune in next time. You know what year we're hitting next. Because that's what we do here. We go year to year. Anyways, guys, my name's Daniel Richardson. Uh, on behalf of the Retro Horror Academy, 
Uh, and uh, yeah, you're dismissed.